Well, hello everybody uh, and welcome to the streaming uh, Pevatron Physics in the context of uh, LASSO results that is part of the public uh, um, of the public seminars of, uh, of the MAGIC uh, collaboration meeting. So my name is uh, Ruben Lopez Cotto, as uh, you can see over there, and uh, together with uh, Daniela Hadash and David Green, I'm uh, one of the galactic uh, coordinators of the MAGIC collaboration. So uh, this, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, so this uh, uh, seminar was, uh, uh, well, we have to thank uh, many people, not only uh, not only us, but also all the physics coordinators of the magic collaboration, all the organizers, uh, the outreach uh, communication team, uh, and so on. So, uh, first of all, thanks everybody. And uh, well, we will have uh, uh, today with us uh, 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 Felix Aharonian. Uh, professor Felix Aharonian is uh, a professor at uh, Diaz Dublin and uh, uh, the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg, and he will be talking to us about uh, these uh, pevatrons. So first of all, let me start saying that, uh, well, uh, due to privacy issues, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have settled this uh, streaming on YouTube, and uh, you, will be able, you will be able to ask uh, a couple of questions uh, to Felix uh, whenever he's uh, done with his talk. Uh, and, but unfortunately, since uh, well, through YouTube you are not able to interact with him uh, personally and so on, so we will uh, we ask Magic members not to type any questions because after this couple of questions we will move to a private uh, Zoom room, in which uh, we will we will be able to interact with him and talk to him and so on. But as I said, uh, due to privacy issues, this uh, uh, this uh, discussion session uh, live with uh, people talking. We will. Uh, we were not able to to host uh, uh, in the in on YouTube. So <clears throat> so with this, I um, I give a pass to Felix that uh, should already be uh, ready. So Felix, hello. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, the, the, it didn't go through. I mean, this. Sorry, Ruben file it returned my email maybe there was big so what should i start but what we, we what we'll do i'm sorry so okay so it. come on it's just uh, unbelievable that was expected so could we i yes. could talk about we what we should do i mean this is Okay, so we received your email already. So sorry, there was some uh, there was some problem with the uh, with the slides, uh, but uh, we have already received them. Uh, I receive. In a second, they will be shared. Ah, you received it. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe yes. That, uh, okay, so maybe I'm sorry for this calls. So I should start maybe until uh, you. Yes. Do not. So don't don't worry about this. So we will be sharing the uh, the slides in a minute. And uh, yeah, so please, maybe you can already start uh, introducing the the topic. Yes. Uh, while the the slides are shared. Okay. Uh, first, thanks for inviting me to this um, to 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 give a talk on a quite exciting topic uh, on the recent results. I'm Felix Aharonia. Ruben already introduced me. I am um, representing. Um, the Lhasa collaboration. I'm not nominal member of Lhasa collaboration. I'm the scientific um, advisor, but I'm involved in all activities now. And then I, 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 I participate in writing papers, etc. So I can tell you hopefully uh, a lot of details about the this exciting results. So I like very much the title suggested for my talk. Physics of Pevatrons in the context of Lahaso results. So I'll start with the first slide. Um, um, so I understand you. Uh, so could go to the first slide, please. Yeah. So this uh, this is the title of the paper, which has been published two weeks ago. In nature, it's called ultra high energy photons up to 1.4 PV from 12 gamma ray 
galactic sources. So uh, you can see the, the main result is here. You can see the, the sky, which can be covered by Lhaso, and you see the galactic plane with indication of uh, TV sources. And you can see uh, 11 of them uh, are, uh, are, are this, the new uh, sources uh, detected at ultra high energies. Crab is outside of this uh, uh, region. So what is spectacular with this table? You can see gamma rays detected above 100 TV with significance more than seven sigma. So in the case of crab, it, uh, it is around 20 sigma. So it's very significant. And another thing is I would call your attention, the, the one of the, from one of the sources, which is, is um, no, you cannot see here the name, but it's called um, Cygnus Cocoon, the highest energy photon detected uh, was at energy 1.4 PV. Uh, so that was, uh, I, I just want to say for, for years, we are dreaming to get 10 TV, 20 TV, 30 TV, or recently 100 TV gamma rays, but suddenly now this instrument is able to detect up to 1 PV and beyond. And flux, as you can see in the light last column, it's about in crab units. Uh, crab, by the way, is not the strongest one. There are others comparable or stronger, but the crab is located very conveniently for Lhaso, so exposure time is more than for other sources. That is the reason that crab has such a high significance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, gamma rays, just very short introduction, is usually we call this segment of electromagnetic spectrum, cosmic electromagnetic spectrum, as a last window. In fact, this last win window covers uh, 10 decades from 0.1 MeV to now could go to up to 100 PV. So now it's 15 decades, uh, 10 decades are covered. And uh, let me, to say that in, um, over the last uh, two decades, we have seen two revolutions in gamma ray astronomy. Uh, and I guess it's not ex exaggeration to call them revolutions. So one was the first decade of this century in gamma ray astronomy. And after the exploitation of the full potential of stereoscopic imaging atmospheric Cherenkov technique. And the second was in GV and low energy gamma rays thanks to the Fermi lot and partly by Agile satellites. And um, I may say that we are the threshold of the further revolution in PV astronomy. And I hope is, this is also not an exaggeration. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, just a few uh, words about TV gamma ray astronomy just to explain uh, why we call it revolution. And uh, at least everyone agrees that the very high energy gamma ray astronomy is a success story. And then uh, it's good to understand reasons. And uh, there are several, of course, as usual, but there are, I would indicate two most important ones. The first, of course, is a great potential of detection technique. It allows very large collection area it allows um, good hadron separation. By the way, when it, this telescopic system um, allowed to get very good uh, hadron separation, gamma hadron separation, and also very good angular resolution, record angular resolution in gamma ray astronomy. It covers three more decades in energy from tens of TV to tens of TV and could go extended beyond, it has a good resolution. So you have morphology, timing, spectrometry, you can provide all this kind of uh, um, uh, measurements. Uh, the only one uh, shortage you see is the limited, relatively small field of view, few degree. And uh, it gives also limited exposure time, typically 100 hours per year. So this is a generally is very nice performance. And then, uh, so that is the first reason for this success story. The second one was 
to a large extent unexpected. It appeared that the universe is full, full of TV gamma ray sources, or we could call full of te tevatrons. So that was uh, quite unexpected and was a nice gift to us. Now we have 250 sources, uh, which is a very good number. It's not just as much as in optical X-ray astronomy, but what is more important in my view here that these 250 sources represent more than 10 source population. It's very, very nice physics and astrophysics. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, now, now why we are optimistic that we could uh, expect another success story. And uh, the reasons are the following. This is, comes from Lahaso. Lahaso, I would call the um, uh, detector from future which operates these days. It, it is really surprisingly quickly uh, has been realized at this very ambitious project. And uh, so it, uh, the, 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 the main parts, again, I'll start the, 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 from the detection potential is the detection area, which is a uh, one square kilometer, actually is uh, less impressive that you get in Cherenkov telescopes because the fluxes are much higher TV energies, but still one square kilometer is a good start. Uh, the very key issue is here, gamma hadron separation, which achieves uh, 10 minus four is better. So it means you reject uh, hadronic showers uh, at the level of 10 to four. Exposure time, the very large field of view, which is about the radian and the exposure time is if you are in the field of view, like crab or other sources, is something between 1,000 to 2,000 hours per year. Just compare with uh, less than one hour, in fact, uh, tens of hours of Cherenkov techniques. So it is also compensate the, the observation time, exposure time. So now you have the nice, yeah, yes, a very re reasonable uh, uh, angular resolution, not as good as the Cherenkov techniques can allow. Um, and a very good energy resolution, about 15%. So if you have a good photon statistics, then you can do uh, also uh, the, the, the lot of nice things uh, like spectrometry, morphology, etc. So, but this is not sufficient. We still should have a more than, uh, we should have a, a gamma ray sources with energy more than 100 TV. And um, again, I, I, I don't think anyone could predict that it could be so many sources above 100 TV uh, on the sky. Uh, in fact, it's a big surprise. By the way, you should do credit, uh, give to uh, Hawk and Tibet. Uh, these two collaborations started to publish interesting um, results about existence of uh, sources with energy more than 100 TV. Now, Lhaso arrived with much more potential, and then immediately after half year of operation, after one year, but uh, half, uh, ha half of instrument was operating, so got so many interesting results. So w w uh, already now we could claim that the universe is full of uh, also of pevatrons. Uh, next slide, please. So PV gamma rays, we call gamma rays above 1.1 uh, PV or 100, above 100 TV. So what uh, here you can see sensitivity compared to uh, Lahaso compared with other instruments. You could see very impressive sensitivity Lahaso above tens of TV. Uh, this, uh, this is an old, uh, old, old, old uh, sensitivity plot some years ago, but now what Lahaso shows uh, almost confirms, even could be a bit better than all the, these, these curves. Typically, we give sensitivities and, and later it, 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 we could realize that it was not as good as before. Here, I would say generally the, uh, the current results of Lahaso confirm this very impressive curve. And the, on the right side, you could see very interesting um, uh, interesting um, uh, plot that is something new in gamma ray astronomy. So I mentioned that Lasso can reject the showers at the level 10 to 4. Actually, 10 to 4 is the at 100 TV, and the 1 PV is 10, 10 to 5. So you keep 
only one from uh, 100,000 showers at one PV. So even cosmic ray showers dominate strongly over gamma ray showers. However, using this uh, separation power plus angular resolution, you could get really very impressive suppression. So what appears that the sources like crop uh, from uh, tens of TV, you detect with Lahaso without background. And that goes um, at the one PV for sure. In fact, background will become not cosmic rays, dominant background, but diffuse gamma rays from galactic plane. So this is a quite interesting, uh, really unusual when you operate, you, you, you detect uh, photons almost without background. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the sources like crab, but even you go 10% of the crab, 10 times weaker sources, still uh, the signal will dominate over the background. Next, 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 please. So uh, then you, you may ask question, don't, then they know oh, this is a great performance. And then of course it's much more powerful about around 100 TV or more Then uh, somehow uh, it could be some, um, when you're comparing with Cherenkov telescope technique, you get some you know, big advantages. It's not at all. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the Cherenkov telescope arrays remain extremely powerful instrument and they have great potential. And uh, as I mentioned, the they collection area could go much more than one uh, square kilometer, like which would be the case of uh, CTA will have the good photon statistic. You could do a lot of important things with 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 with, with, with um, uh, CTA. Let's say the major instrument for future, and then it will be very good match of sensitivities of CTA and Lahaso. At this moment, Lahaso sensitivity at hundred uh, TV um, is exceeds the sensitivity at chunk of telescopes at TV energies. Um, but we should not compare directly this SED, so-called energy fluxes, because typically uh, we, 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 as we'll see, um, the, the energy, uh, the spe spectra are quite steep, and you, of course, should have a um, better sensitivity at 100 TV energies in order to uh, match the sensitivities of Cherenkov telescopes. Next slide, please. So then uh, let me show that the three sources detected, three strong sources after uh, comp with the, together with the crop. Uh, the, the, you can see very impressive uh, error bars at low energies. And, uh, and um, you see the extension of the sources. The, uh, the PSF allows to claim that sources are extended up to half, one degree. I'm talking about these sources. Uh, I mentioned the background free detection. You can see in this table, like the, the first uh, line is the crop nebula. You could see have been detected uh, 67 gamma rays against five and five uh, background events. So fact, uh, the signal exceeds the background factor of 10. And this is the same for other sources. Um, so uh, the results on the exposure time you see now, 2000, it is approximately one year, but the, 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 the detection and the, the detectors were not completed fully. So it's about 50% of uh, potential of Lahaso. So it means for Starting July, when Lahaso will have 100%, uh, will be fully completed, then uh, you would expect um, twice more statistics for one year. Another issue I want to show here, this gamma-gamma absorption, you know, gamma rays are quite fragile, and they interact with the photons. At 1 PV, main, uh, main, main uh, target for absorption are 2.7 K background radiation photons at low energies in the galactic plane is are more important the diffuse uh, uh, the background at 
inf infrared and optical wavelengths. So fortunately, as you can see, for these sources, uh, the, the um, absorption is not a very uh, big issue. So you could easily correct for absorption. It's less than 50% are absorbed. Of course, if you have the sources at large distances, like Cygnus X3, for example, around 8 kiloparsec, then absorption will be more significant. But still, it's uh, what concerns galactic sources, we should not face big problem for correcting uh, fluxes for uh, gamma gamma absorption. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is, I show that one of the sources, one, one of the examples um, that, that just mentioned that um, uh, typically we, we are hoping that if you go beyond 100 TV, you should not have a problem with um, the, the, the choice leptonic or so-called leptonic or hadronic. It appears not. Still, you could uh, you will face a similar problem. You could uh, explain the results both by hadronic and proton-proton uh, interactions or leptonic inverse Compton scattering by electrons. Is uh, the numbers you could see uh, the, the the curves and the the assumptions? They are quite reasonable uh, in the sense that you could explain. The, um, uh, the, 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 the 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 these uh, the, the, these results by inverse Compton and proton-proton interaction by nearby supernova remnant in case of the hadronic uh, interpretation or uh, so-called pulsar halo emission around the quite strong pulsar 1907. So uh, please note that here spectrum is steep and all spectra by the way uh, are quite steep uh, detected by lahaso by the way that shows the the great potential of lahaso you measure spectra steep spectra with a good accuracy that that you have to have a very good sensitivity to do that so another thing i'll call your attention is the following if st spectra are typically we think that and that is true that energy which goes in proton-protein interactions to gamma rays is about 10% of the parent protons. However, if you have steep spectra, then it's, it's, it's the, the, the difference between energy of the proton and gamma ray uh, becoming less. So in fact, it's about factor of three or four. So uh, the, the, the protons, uh, to, to produce 300 TV uh, photons, you need for the steep spectra, approximately one PV proton. So in other uh, sense, uh, we should not simply multiply, if, we, if you see 300 TV, um, uh, t the, uh, TV gamma rays, you should not assume that spectrum goes well beyond one PV. As I said, because the steep spectrum is the same for inverse Compton scattering. Why I'm saying that? Because typically when we get with Cherenkov telescope, something like detecting 20, 30 TV um, gamma rays or maybe 50 TV, we immediately assume this should be pevatron because you multiply spectrum by 10, 20. Um, in the case of st steep spectra, it's not, strongly speaking, is not correct. So really, if you want to understand the, 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 the to, to pevatrons, you have to go to very uh, high energies, very, I mean, ultra high energies, well above 100 TV. At the same time, that doesn't reduce the significance of low energies because in order to get a good uh, the, the SED modeling, you need good measurements at uh, TV energies. In fact, you have to go to low energies, to GV energies, and uh, for two reasons. One, the energy coverage, and second, you have with Cherenkov telescope much better morphology, and that is a critical for identification of the sources. So in other words, what I want to say, we need very much Cherenkov telescopes to interpret properly the results of Lahaso. That is 
uh, concerns the morphology, as I said, the much better imaging with Cherenkov telescope, but also it's very important to go to low energies. So low energies mean up to GV, 10, 20, maybe 200 GV. And that is also is very important because we'll have now, when we, we at least with CTA, the uh, energy will extend it to low energies and then uh, it could be much better uh, information uh, than we can get these days from Fermi. So at least for tens of GVs. So, so to conclude, the, uh, to, to identify all the Lhasa sources, to study the physics, uh, the Cherenkov um, uh, instruments are absolutely necessary to have them. And uh, fortunately, we have now uh, both in the north and south, Cherenkov telescope arrays like his, Veritas, Magic. So it's 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 very complementary, and that I'm sure will be used even before uh, CTA will arrive to understand better results of Laha. So next next slide, please. Next slide. So this is uh, just to say that we there's all these twelve sources. Uh, we uh, you could see many counterparts, and that is not so easy just to distinguish which one, uh, we, which one um, really corresponds to the Lahaso source. So it it is a lot of work. But just to say a few words. I mean, the, what is the firmly identified this crab crab nebula? Uh, you cannot see here the young supernova remnants. There are several candidates for middle-aged supernova remnants. There are several candidates for possibly nebula or possible halos. And there are some clusters, young stellar clusters, in particular, the Cygnus cocoon, which surround the Cygnus OB um, cluster. And that is photons I, I mentioned goes up to 1.4 PV from this source. Next slide. Okay, that was, uh, we could go to move. Uh, I already said that how it's important uh, for Lahaso, etc. arrays. And yes, on the next slide, I already mentioned how it will be important to have a Cherenkov telescope. Please, next slide. So now we're coming, what is the implications of Lahaso? Of course, there is no much time. I could be very quick now saying that uh, Lahaso first will address the question about the uh, contributors to the uh, the one PV region of the galactic cosmic rays. That could be great contribution to uh, uh, understanding of origin of the cosmic rays. Next slide. And uh, so detecting uh, galactic pevatrons, proton pevatrons, that will give you a lot of information about uh, the contributors. So far, uh, we are thinking that there is a featureless power law spectrum up, up to the so-called knee, and that was interpreted as a should be a single source population should contribute the, the, the basically will contribute the entire flux around one PV. Now we know it's not the case, and the second uh, belief was that this, this single source population should be supernova remnants, and that is again. It looks like we should change the, the 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 concepts dramatically. Next slide. So I just want to say this. First of all, it's not clear that we have a single, very smooth, uh, the uh, spectrum up to one knee. You see the there are a lot of structures. By the way, this will be related uh, in the diffuse background, and then Lahaso is a very powerful source to detect the diffuse background. At the, the end, the structure around the knee or the mass composition uh, could be could be solved at least partly by gamma ray observations of Lahaso. And Lahaso is also a cosmic ray detector, and that Lahaso will also contribute just to measuring directly cosmic rays around the knee. So uh, what, what, what here, what 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 we you see the structure, you could think there's a drop of the spectrum below one TV. So you could have doubts that 
there should not be pevatrons maybe, and that will make life much easier than in the sense of, um, I'll come to that point, not, not finding uh, the uh, gamma ray sources uh, at uh, energies above 100 TV uh, from supernova remnants, that is a problem, but uh, in, in fact, should not be problem with um, uh, protons uh, to, to get protons uh, up to one, one PV and even beyond. So most likely we expect not simply nominal pevatrons, which means up to one protons up to one PV, but it means that we most likely should have a super pevatrons in our galaxy. And that is very important to detect also gamma rays above one PV. So that was, I want to indicate how is important just detection also above one PV. Now statistic is not very large, um, uh, but in coming years, uh, most likely we'll see a lot of interesting, exciting results. I guess also surprises what uh, relevant to the super pevatrons in lactic plane. Next, next slide, please. So, um, just uh, I want to say that, that a few words about one means the origin of the cosmic rays. Of course, one of the major issues in cosmic ray physics, astrophysics, is to find the main contributors to the flux we see locally, which I call local folk, but they could be much more uh, broader. Fundamental issue is that uh, the, with gamma rays, we detect the sources, the, the super accelerators, which we don't see directly, maybe. Uh, we, they don't contribute to the local cosmic ray flux, but they are very powerful accelerators. So gamma ray astronomy results um, imply much more than simply uh, understanding the, 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 the focal law, uh, the, 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 uh, um, the, um, the, the contribution to the local folk. Next slide, please. So there just, we could pass this as a nice picture. What is surprise at TV energies, at GV energies, we will have seen that there are many, uh, almost all suspected non-thermal source populations uh, producing accelerating particles to GV energies, to TV energies. And now we are con conclude that they are going now to PV energies. So as I said, this is a, absolutely unexpected results. What, first of all, implies that there are factories of the cosmic rays which um, accelerate particles with incredibly efficiency to get PV energies. I'm talking about the proton accelerators, but um, we will have, uh, we have also already, at least one example, we have for sure Crab Nebula, the electrons are accelerated also to PV energies. That is much more difficult, much more complex to accelerate electrons to PV energies. So this, these sources we call absolute extreme accelerators in the sense that everything proceeds there at the level of maximum possible acceleration rate uh, allowed by theory. Next slide, please. So I just want to say that there is not only uh, the, the aspect of the um, cosmic ray physics, but also the very important as aspects of accelerators. And uh, the, uh, they are, uh, in that case, the so-called extreme accelerators have a central position in, in, in the future studies of Lahaso because Lahaso will really get the point when you could say efficiency is just close to 100%. Almost now is the case for the Crab Nebula, but with adding statistics, it will be maybe more sources. Next slide, please. Uh, so I don't have much time to go, just uh, just go ahead because this extra galactic source is not much, much interest. So this is what I want to say, the Crab. Uh, so uh, Lhaso has a paper um, in the will be uh, published maybe in July on the crop in science. I cannot tell you much, but what I can tell you that detection of uh, gamma rays with energy 1 PV from the crop nebula is dramatically 
will uh, have dramatic impact on the theory of acceleration of electrons in the crop. It depends what is the mechanism is operating there. It is clear that the, the acceleration should proceed at the level of uh, maximum level allowed by classical electrodynamics and ideal MHD. In other words, from the first principles. So just it should go around one PV. This result is coming. Next, next slide, please. So coming about cosmic ray, I should uh, go too fast. Uh, I, 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 I uh, just what what, what Lahaso shows that we have now electron pevatron in the Crab Nebula. We have proton pevatrons most likely, and then um, that that could be because of the supernova round and stellar winds um, in the young stellar clusters. I already mentioned that most likely this will be clusters of young stars rather than supernova remnants, but we should not rush. This is a very interesting issue. It is coming future. It also could be galactic center contributor. Unfortunately, uh, Lahaso cannot see galactic center. And uh, we, we still will should expect some interesting results from uh, so-called relativistic outflows jets in our galaxy. I mean, this is the first candidate is SS433. But there are could other interesting objects like Cygnus X1, Cygnus X3, GRS 1915, etc. Next slide, please. Um, okay, just we could pass this this one. I think it's not, uh, there's no much time to focus on that. So just mentioned about now very briefly about galactic cosmic rays since um, already 70 uh, years, 1933. Seminal paper by Bade Itzviki. All we are uh, were thinking that the supernova remnants should be the prime candidates as contributors to cosmic rays, uh, including uh, around one PV, um, and that was a very simple argument. And we are hoping to see gamma rays from supernova remnants um, going up to at least hundred TV. So uh, it was. Next, next slide, please. So it was a hope, and the hope has been, uh, next slide, uh, uh, hope um, uh, has been um, realized for, I just show one nice example how you could derive the proton spectra within hadronic uh, interpretation from the observation of the young supernova around 1713. But you see here in the proton spectrum a cutoff around 100 TV, and that is the best example. In fact, all other super rem remnants have much steeper spectra. Could you go next slide, please? Next slide. So there are a couple of problems with interpretation of supernova remnants, young supernova remnants. First of all, it could be hadronic, could be leptonic. Both, both are, we cannot exclude at this moment. Uh, however, for us, it's more important Let's even assume that they are hadronic. Next slide, please. Then if, if hadronic, you have to expect gamma rays extending this hard spectra up to 100 TV, uh, which is not the case. Even the most famous ones, Sene, uh, sorry, uh, Cassiopeia A, Cassie and uh, Tycho, they have quite steep spectra, and that was quite unexpected. Uh, next slide. So how you interpret these results? There are interesting implications of this hard spectra. You could assume there are hard spectra, but uh, early cutoffs. So then you could get for the uh, limited uh, energy range this steep spectra. It means that you could not exclude that supernova remnants are pevatrons. On the other hand, if you interpret the results with the early cutoff, then of course they cannot be pevatron. So what will be the result? We have to, it doesn't mean that these sources are not pevatrons. If steep spectra, then still it possibility is there, but then we have to go and to, to try to get them at the very high energies. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I talk about two options and uh, we'll see. 
Uh, theory also allows tip spectra uh, injection spe acceleration spectra of cosmic rays, and these are uh, very. I mean, the uh, E minus two type spectra actually has ideal uh, solution for the ideal situation of diffusive shock acceleration. In fact, uh, theory allows steep spectra, and uh, also experimentally, we do expect steeper spectra than E minus two from sources of the cosmic rays, taking into account that diffusion, the uh, index of diffusion coefficient cannot be uh, larger than 0.5. So uh, I would say question now still is open. We should not give up saying supernova remnants are not sources of, um, uh, they are not operating as pevatrons. We will see, and the Lahaso is the best position to answer to these questions. Please, next slide. And uh, one thing, I mean, uh, the, if they are pevatrons, then at least clear should be they should accelerate particles at very early epochs. And then you could say, oh, if these early epochs, then what we can do with, um, so it's everything is gone. We don't have a chance to detect them. Actually, this is not the case. You still could detect them, but not directly from the supernova remnants, but the nearby gas complexes when uh, protons, uh, the protons which escape the, uh, the shell, they still um, go quite a long time to reach these uh, complexes of uh, we call giant molecular clouds to produce them gamma rays. And it's likely that we started to see many of these type of objects. Next slide, please. So this is the typical example when, when you, at uh, the early epochs, you expect gamma rays uh, hard energy gamma rays up to 100 TV even more from the shell of supernova remnants, but it takes not long. Later, it goes, um, uh, the, the, the chance to see these protons is only at later epochs when they interact, they, when they escape the source and interact with the nearby clouds. Uh, but we should be also here very, very careful because the anisotropy, the escape could be anisotropic, and then you actually could see not simply the cloud of the gas as a target, but also you could see the enhanced gamma rays because there'll be cloud of cosmic rays. So they escape collectively. Uh, don't individual particle escape the supernova remnant shell, but the collectively like the clouds together and could be very interesting pictures. So picture could be much more complicated. Next, next slide. So now what, 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 what the, the, the last thing what I want to call your attention is that we have to be very careful if we are going to very high energies. So when we are using diffusive uh, approach for propagation, and then you have to be careful that we can, uh, we can use this uh, approach because if uh, the, 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 the distance mean pre of particles becoming larger than the, 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 the source, so particles start to uh, propagate rectilinearly. So there are two stages, rectilinear propagation or ballistic propagation, and then transition from ballistic to diffusive, uh, um, the stage of propagation and only diffusive state propagation. So what is imp interesting implication for gamma rays is that if you have the, the, the ballistic um, motion, then at first glance, you could see that the particles propagating further, they occupy much more volume, then they should be very extended sources. That is not true. You would expect point-like sources, just exactly opposite. So here's the uh, one example. If you see the low energy particles because diffusion coefficient for them is smaller, they give you very large extended emission. If you go to highest energies, what you expect to get even larger, uh, larger size for the source, angular size. Uh, the physical size, okay, thanks. Uh, physical size, in fact, is larger. But angular size is getting small. This is very, very simple effect, of course, geometrical. And uh, that could bring very interesting 
um, results. So as I said, you could see point like source. You'll think this is a this is a really you are coming from the accelerator gamma ray emission. In fact, gamma ray emission come from the huge volume occupied by cosmic rays. Next slide. Yes, I'm just finishing this. I feel fine. Next slide, please. So just to show that could be very funny things, in fact. I mean, uh, if if you don't have the between observer and the source some uh, large material of gas, and there's the clouds are located um, uh, not in on, on, on the on line of sight. So uh, you could see gamma rays at highest energies, not from the nearby clouds, but very uh, far clouds. Reason is that because uh, the nearby clouds, cosmic ray are passing um, ballistically. They produce, of course, gamma rays, but these gamma rays are not coming us. Only at the very end, when they isotropized, they can produce gamma rays from the <clears throat> distant clouds. And if you see this picture, you'll think you are detecting different sources because it's unrealistic, unreasonable, but in fact, this simply is re uh, the reason of the inhomogeneous distribution of the gas and ballistic distribution of cosmic rays. Next slide. Next slide, please. So then I'm coming to a very interesting issue about this, the same effect you'll see also for uh, electrons. And um, in the, this case, you should not speculate with the target. Target we know, 2.7K isotropic. Then that could be very interesting result in the sense that um, that 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 you will uh, you, you so just the, the, the showing example from recent um, study of this uh, correct study of this uh, the propagation aspect when you include this possibility of transition from not possibility and it should happen the from ballistic to diffusive in that in that case you could have the two solutions for example to feed the Lasso data, uh, sorry, the, the, the Hogue data for Geminga, it could be large diffusion coefficient and small, small as, as, as before it's correct, but is not excluded large or nominal diffusion coefficient. And here, result of the compact angular size is that the, 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 the uh, angular size is um, the, the, this ballistic motion at the very large segment of propagation segment. So what is important here? It, it makes life a bit more complicated, right, to, to derive uh, the conclusion. But on the other hand, I mean, if you have a diffusion coefficient, you simply treat um, uh, 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 in appropriate way the propagation. But what, what is very nice thing here? If you go very high and just, at the end, you'll have the ballistic propagation for a very large distances. For example, for a nominal diffusion coefficient in our galaxy, for one PV electrons, which produce 300 TV photons, they'll propagate 100 parsec ballistically, and then you'll see point-like source. What that means? That means that with the highest energies, you localize the accelerator. Even you produce the, the, the radiation in many large volume, but it will go back to the accelerator. So that is a unique, I'd say one of the most unique features which can be realized by Lahaso. This is a concern both for electrons and also proton pevatrons. So that is the last thing I'd like to uh, indicate in my um, talk. Um, and then uh, maybe just to show the summary. I mean, this is a, of course, um, I cannot cover all the aspects, just, just go very last slide. And then the summary is the following, that um, you could have these slides. It's, I mean, if, if you want, you could share with you the presentation. Uh, just the last slide is saying that what, what Lahaso says now, I mean, what Lahaso has published, of course, this is a very first result. And uh, uh, now, Lahaso, um, this this list which I, I showed you, it's a um, very tough condition, seven sigma above 100 TV, and then uh, and the very limited exposure time. Now, if you can imagine, if 
and the sources don't go only 100 TV will be on. There will be many other sources. And of course, there will be, it's clear that La Haswa will have many sources. And not, not necessarily only Pevatrons, but also Pevatrons, weak Pevatrons. So everything is coming. What we see is the only the tip of iceberg. And um, it is clear that in coming years, we should expect some breakthrough discoveries and which could be dramatically change our current concepts regarding both electron and uh, proton pevatrons. And um, since this is the magic collaboration meeting, I just say this is a, uh, I, I, I tried to spend actually a lot of time to, to convince, not convince, I think you are convinced yourself. It's, it's clear that the, the Lahaso is a very complementary, and even to understanding the pevatrons, you need also low energy measurements. You don't need to go with Cherenkov telescope, or we, we don't need to go to 100 TV or beyond, but at low energies, having the super uh, angular resolution and going to very low energies, um, we could understand Lahaso results much better than uh, Lahaso results alone. I'm saying very trivial things. We all know how popular is so-called multi-messenger and multi-wavelength approach. But in this case, in multi-wavelength approach, the, the results will, will come with Cherenkov telescopes will be most critical ones for interpretation of Lahaso results. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felix, for this uh, very nice talk and very comprehensive. And uh, yeah, you manage uh, in the end to, to present all uh, 52 slides, even though you had to skip some of them. So thank you very much. Uh, so we have, uh, yeah, we have a couple of questions and uh, uh, over there you have, so uh, as we said, uh, we will allow only a, a couple of questions here now, and then we will pass to the private uh, room in which uh, we will be able to uh, keep discussing with uh, ma with uh, magic people. So over there, you have uh, the first one is uh, if you can read it, can lasso be used to find unidentified pulsars not beam towards us? Uh, yes, sure. I mean, it's uh, because lasso will detect the, this pulse. I mean, in fact, the pulsar, pulse of wind, pulse. Uh, the nebula is a very complex con conglomerate. I mean, that was uh, what Lhasa detects. These PV electrons are detected far from the pulsars, although energy comes from the pulsar. I mean, this rotational energy is almost 100% at the end converts to the electrons. And then now, uh, if you detect the, the, the gamma emission of these electrons, then you could um, uh, uh, find uh, information about the pulsar. So what I said, of course, they will be isotropized. I mean, the, the acceleration takes place isotropic, is isotropic, is isotropic. So electrons are leaving the, the acceleration sites and they propagate diffusively at very high energies. They are diffusively uh, propagating also inside the so-called pulsar in nebulae. Not only just because it's just the, uh, the, the so in that case, we'll produce inverse Compton uh, emission. This is a, one of the best examples actually in astrophysics when you detect gamma rays and you have 100% sure that you, you, you'll recover the electrons, both angular distribution and uh, the, the spatial distribution and energy distribution, so to inverse Compton. So Lahaso uh, audit has been done by Hawke. It was a great achievement, Hawke and Hess has got a lot of possible nebulae. Um, Hawke added more, and then uh, there is an idea that could be not only possible in nebulae, also the surrounding possible in nebulae, so-called possible halos. Um, Lahaso will have a much more sensitivity than Hawke. We'll see uh, many of them, but most exciting one is will be that Lahaso will go to as I try to explain, I'm not sure how successfully, if you go to hundreds of TV, then these electrons will propagate ballistically, and that would allow you just to fix the position of the pulsar, because the main problem with uh, this identification of the pulsar, which 
energize, which, uh, which gives you this halos. So it could be surrounding several halos. You could think this not only the inverse quantum, could be some um, other sources, but with good accuracy, if you fix the position of the accelerator, that is the pulsar, not pulsar itself, but the so-called position of the termination shock, which is a bit 0.1 parsec, let's say, from the pulsar. You'll fix that position, and then you'll for sure know that and then if you fix such position without having pulsars, that that will be what you said. That will be the case when the uh, there is a pulse up with powerful rotational energy spin down, but we don't see because of the beaming problem. But we see the results in a such a sophisticated way. Energy of pulsar goes to the wind. Wind terminates. Oxford electrons, electrons propagate to distances tens of parsec, maybe 100 parsec, and you get point-like source, which goes to that position to say, at this position should be pulsar. So th the, the answer would be that, yes, if, uh, if a pulsar is, uh, uh, whose beam is not pointing towards us, we could detect it uh, uh, yeah. using a lasso, right? Uh, yeah, the, same way that, the same way that uh, Geminga and uh, Pulsar BO656 were detected by Hawk and now also by Lasso, right? Yes, exactly. So Hawk already did that. But what the, I'm both, saying, yes. just to fix position of the pulsar, that could be a very interesting thing. Because you don't know there's a pulsar or not. But you get point like source because, OK, he's a pulsar. OK, so thank you. You already got uh, congratulations uh, from uh, Richard Mitchell. And uh, we have now, uh, now time only for one additional question. And uh, it is uh, that of uh, Cisca Bo. Uh, could Lasso detect extragalactic sources or would the absorption be a problem? Um, it's a good question. Yes, I mean, um, uh, the, the Mi free path for uh, one PV gamma rays is about uh, eight kiloparsecs, so not beyond our galaxy. But 100 kV also, few megaparsecs. Maybe you could see that from Sene. 100 TV. If you go even further, next source interesting is MAT. Uh, yes, there are some uh, the star, uh, starburst galaxies like M82 or M82 actually is in the north for the Lahaso. It could go up to uh, up to tens of TV, even more, unless they will be absorbed inside the galaxies. And then another thing is uh, the M87. Then you should see up to 30 TV. Now, if we if we trust this uh, ABL, uh, the, the background measurements or theory, and then if you go to uh, very large distance ones, like Markan 501, 421, still there's a chance to see 20 TV. And Lhaso is quite sensitive also to 20 TV. That was, uh, I want to say, is a nearby cosmos, of course is nearby cosmos. But let me just mention that Lahaso is only this detector is called KM2A, kilometer square array. Lahaso was the second detector. I was not mentioning that today because there's not published. I mean, the, this is a likely hawk, but four times larger hawk. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it is a, has a very low threshold. It should go to 100 GV. And in that case, that could be perfect instrument for gamma ray burst and gamma ray burst um, afterglows especially for gamma ray burst at very early stage, since it is quite good. So what has the magic and has detected afterglows and magic early afterglows give all, I mean, the optimist that Lahaso will get this stuff. So even large Z up to one. So right now, local extragalactic universe and then whenever it is complete, it will go far, right? Uh, yes. Still, I think the Cherenkov telescope could do the bit, bit, better job. Yeah. I mean, for the vari variability or like like CTA, but uh, but generally, yes. Up to, if it could go up to 100 GV with sensitivity close to today's instrument, like like HES or Magic or Veritas. Yes, that that will do. Okay, very good. Thank you very much for your presentation and for answering the the questions, Felix. And uh, now we are we are going to the private room. So all magicians, please uh, join the the room that uh, you have uh, received uh, by email. 
uh, the Zoom room. And uh, please, Felix, uh, also join us uh, over there in the in the same email in which you send the slides. Uh, you have the the link uh, to the Zoom room with the password. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so let us uh, thank uh, Felix again. Uh, let us uh, let us thank uh, everybody who participated in the organization of. Uh, uh, of this event, uh, and Daniela and David, uh, who are also the Galactic Conveners behind uh, helping out with the organization of, uh, the, of the questions and so on. And uh, well, everybody for coming. So thanks, everybody, and uh, see you. Thank you. Thank you very much.